if the bell doesn't go, it means the practice hasn't ended, right? So in this, uh, this same spirit that I've been talking about during these couple of days, um, as uh, this time uh, of our little community uh, winds down, the last uh, time together, I uh, would encourage everyone to be considering things in this way. That, uh, just because a bell rings doesn't mean that uh, we stop practicing. It doesn't mean that uh, anything has changed in terms of the attention that we pay to each moment, but rather uh, it's just a, a change of mode. We're in retreat, we're not in retreat. Informal practice, formal practice. Things change their modes, they change their style, their form. But the Dhamma remains the same. Uh, and the importance of, of paying attention remains the same. Many years ago, I had uh, planned to walk the length of England from Chithurst Monastery down in the south, in Sussex, all the way up to a new branch monastery in Northumberland, in the far north on the Scottish border. So there's a, a journey with a, a winding route and uh, about 800 or so miles. I've been planning for many months, I've built my own sandals, made many training walks and preparations. And then the morning that uh, myself and my walking companion, Nick Scott, were leaving from Chithurst Monastery, uh, Ajahn Sumedho gave a very simple and, and potent reflection. He said, actually, there's nobody going anywhere. There are just conditions of mind that are changing. This was very helpful, beautiful reflection. The mind so fixed on me going somewhere. But we've got 830 miles ahead of us. All these places, all these people, all this time. But in that simple phrase, he pointed out people, time, places. These are all mental constructs. Location, selfhood, time. These are all conditioned patterns of perception. They arise and pass away within our, our awareness. They take shape, different patterns of consciousness, they dissolve, and they all happen here. There's nobody going anywhere. There are just conditions of mind that are changing. Regardless of whether the location says uh, IRC outside of Santa Cruz, San Francisco Airport, PDX Airport, Portland, where I'm due to fly to today. The perception of PDX, feelings, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, physical sensations arising and passing away. IRC. Sound, feeling, sight, arising and passing away. They all happen here. As the, uh, the time proceeds and midday comes and all the cleaning tasks are finished, you say all your goodbyes, have the closing circle, reconnecting with Gil and each other, Vehicles go in all sorts of different directions. Down to Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Los Angeles. 
Reno, San Francisco, Berkeley, Mendocino. Wherever the vehicles go, they're known within consciousness. Patterns of perception coming and going, changing. Reno is a perception in the mind. Watsonville is a perception in the mind. Abhayagiri Monastery. Aranya Bodhi Hermitage. Perceptions arise and pass away. They all happen here. They're known here. And when we see the world happens in our mind, the heart attunes itself to Dhamma. It attunes itself to that fundamental, timeless, still, spacious, natural, non-personal quality being that very knowing, that vijja, that awakened awareness, the stillness that knows the flowing of the water, the ending of becoming, not by stopping the flow, but by attuning to that dimension which is free from time, free from place, free from individuality, from separateness from birth and death, unborn, undying, unlimited. One time a devata came to the Buddha and said, when I was a human being, in my last life I was a yogi and I made the, valley, the, the vow to, to spend my life giving value to the journey to the end of the world. Even to the extent of developing psychic powers so I could, I could fly through the air. I was a skywalker, as it says in the scripture. But no matter how far I journeyed, I couldn't come to the end of the world. I never reached the end of the world. And the Buddha responded by saying, yeah, Rohitasa, it's true, you can never reach the end of the world by walking. But I tell you, until you reach the end of the world, you'll never reach the end of dukkha, of suffering. Well, the end of the world is not a big precipice. not the destruction of the planet, the end of the world is the realization of that timeless, unlimited, unborn, undying, completely liberated aspect of our own being, which is already here, has never been anywhere else than right at the very center of our life. But we miss it because we're so busy with time, things, our to-do list, our successes, our failures, our gains, our losses, praise, criticism. So busy that we miss what's already here. We forget. This little time of retreat is also a big time. We call it little, small, brief, just a couple of days. But we can also see it as being vast, huge. Two and a half days, nearly three whole days. All those opportunities to look into our own heart, to find what's here. All this time, 
to awaken to the timeless. Uh, Buddha Dhamma is a teaching of personal responsibility. It's not a, a teaching based on getting zapped by a guru from outside, receiving grace from the divine up above. It's a, a teaching of personal responsibility, personal effort. You have to do the rescuing. Someone who's in the role of teaching or guiding can point out the way, but each one of us has to, to listen, to internalize those instructions, to learn the map. Just like, I now can find my way from the shrine room back to my room without getting lost. I feel a great sense of achievement. Memorize the twists and turns of the, the way through the building. It's up to us to learn. It's not going to just be done to us. We might dream of having an implant that can just slot in behind your ear and then all your troubles fall away and enlightenment arrives. But it, I don't think it'll be this year. the teaching of personal responsibility, personal effort. So even if the teacher is not around, the, re the formal retreat is over, we're back on the freeway, the retreat doesn't have to be over. The jitta viveka, the internal seclusion, can still carry on. I have to catch a plane today, so I have to step down in a few minutes' time and Gil will step up. The mind might say, oh, well, it's all over now. Might as well just get in the car and go. Everybody else can look after the, the wrap-up, the tidy-up. Ajahn Amro's gone. Yeah, not really worth bothering with the rest. <laughs> Gil, Schmil. <pff. laughs> this is called wrong view. And with extremely nasty karmic consequences, I'm sure. <laughs> like Ajahn Chah would often say, yeah, don't just be a, a well-behaved monk when the Ajahn's around and when the Ajahn's not there. Don't think that nobody's watching. Because you are watching. You know what you're doing. You know where the mind is going. You know what the mind dwells upon. You know. It's our mind, our life. It's for us. We're not doing this to be serving an institution, to be paying obeisance to a method out of obligation or compulsion or superstition. It's for us. It's for you. So just because the voice changes, the practice continues. Just because the venue changes, the practice continues. Formal, informal, the practice continues. Quiet and serene, well protected, safe, fragrance free. <laughs> or unprotected, stinky, <laughs> agitated, rude, <laughs> uh, freeway behaviors that we have to deal with from others who are not keeping the precepts, <laughs> cutting us off, giving us the finger, the practice continues. The world is not polite. Lumpo Chao would say, sickness and death have no manners. They just show up, kick the door in, 
and they never even waited for an invitation. Life is rude. Things happen. We get injuries, people insult us, our projects fall apart, illnesses arrive, people that we love turn away from us. The practice continues. Things all come together, our stock goes through the ceiling, suddenly <coughs> everything is easy, beautiful, we can move to that perfect place that we've always wanted, help fund the retreat center, send Gil on holiday to England. <laughs> <laughs> the practice continues. If we're wise, whether things are bitter or sweet, delightful or difficult, the practice continues. Whether you're on the retreat and the Ajahn is watching you, Gil is giving you personal advice, or whether you're back home in your, in your sitting room, all by yourself in your little meditation room, bored out of your mind after seven minutes on the cushion, the practice continues. This is how we really develop. This is how we make the most of our opportunity as a, a human being, this precious, beautiful human life of ours. If we bring that inquiring mind, that inquisitive, reflective attitude, then everything will teach us. Out on the freeway being insulted, serene in the shrine room, at home with our cat sitting on our lap, everything will teach us. Bitter loneliness left by yourself on a cold, wet winter day. Beautiful, serene time with dear companions. Everything will teach us if we let it. If we bring that in inquisitive, reflective mind ask, what is this teaching me? What can I learn from this? What blessings does this bring? And it's right there. The teaching, the Dhamma is right there. Right here. Without fail. Or when we consider the quality of non-attachment or non-entanglement, I encourage everyone to recollect that non-attachment also involves participation. Vijja and charana go together. Awareness and activity, they go together. They're a pair. So when we're endeavouring to practice non-attachment, see how that manifests in terms of fulfilling our responsibilities. Rather than, it's all empty, I'm practicing non-attachment, I'm going to go home and leave you to do the cleaning. Wrong view. <laughs> I'm practicing non-attachment, Therefore, how can I help with the cleaning?
our non-attachment or non-entanglement, non-grasping of life, manifests as an attentive, unselfish, mindful, participating. Dhamma is duty. And duty not as a sense of pressurized obligation, but just serving the moment. What's needed? How can I help? If something needs to be done, then with a heart of non-attachment, non-entanglement, we step forward to join in, to help out. If there's nothing to be done, then we leave it alone. We're not trying to make ourselves busy as some sort of misguided attempt at virtue. If there's nothing to do, don't do anything. If there's something to do, then join in, help out. Fulfill the, the needs of of the group, the requirements of the moment. We're developing a naturally responsive heart. Sometimes it's even more difficult to leave things alone, to not be busy, than to, to join in and help out. But responsivity involves both of those. When there's something to do, to join, to engage with a good heart. When there's nothing to do, just allow things to be empty, to be still. Not to follow those compulsions of needing to have a defined sense of being by habitual activity, doing something just so that I can feel like somebody someone. We don't have to do that. We can leave the moment undefined. We can leave our sense of being undefined. Open. Limitless. And in terms of helping to sustain this attitude of citta viveka, or internal seclusion, non-entanglement, the structure of the precepts, the five precepts, is a very clear and helpful framework for living. It helps us to sustain that attitude of reflectiveness helps us to avoid creating karmically weighty engagements and actions. Steers us towards speech and activity that is a blessing to others, that is benign, liberating. It supports the, the Brahma Viharas of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy serenity. When the retreat finishes, midday today, then uh, I suspect Gil will give the opportunity for people to determine the, the, uh, the five precepts as a way of carrying this same spirit forth. As the the vehicles start rolling, we separate, and this little community comes to its natural conclusion. And the precepts are your own portable retreat. They're what you can take with you. They create an environment of spiritual engagement. They support the, the attitude of wakefulness, the attitude of friendliness, compassion, harmlessness. Even if others are behaving disrespectfully towards you or dishonestly towards you, aggressively towards you, there's nothing in the universe that compels us to act in the same way. The framework of the five precepts helps us to sustain a, uh, an environment of security, 
to protect our own heart. And also, it offers a standard to others. Not in terms of rubbing your virtue into people's faces. Look at how pure I am. Aren't you impressed? It's not being obnoxiously virtuous, but just letting others see that when people are getting upset and angry, you're not joining in. When others want to manipulate and cheat, you're not joining in. When others want to use bad language and be insulting or use aggressive or obnoxious speech, you're not joining in. Not out of a uptight moral superiority, but just out of a, a love of the good. A love of what is noble, respectful. And that carries its own message. That brings its own blessings. Others notice that you're not joining in. You're not supporting those destructive and foolish behaviors. And that's encouraging. That's a beautiful and helpful example for those around us. And we see very directly, the good results for ourselves. How much peace we feel, how much more easeful life is when we haven't got to protect a lie, to sustain an untruth. What a relief. Well, during these few days I've spoken a lot about letting go of feelings of self, self-centered thinking, attitudes. And the natural counterpart to, to that self-view, self-centered thinking, Sakaya Ditti, as that falls away, what rises up in its place is a sense of gratitude, gratefulness for those around us. As we stop fixating, obsessing about me, my life, my feelings, my practice, my preferences, my space, as that I and me and mine is seen as transparent, void of, of substance, the heart broadens and opens. We begin to appreciate what we are receiving from those around us, the world around us, the living environment, the people who, who help us along the way. So as self-concern diminishes and falls away, what rises up is gratefulness. So at the ending of a retreat time like this, it's very appropriate to let that gratefulness blossom, let it be conscious. Grateful to Gil and all those who gathered together and had the vision to create this space. 
gratefulness for the people who've been uh, putting their e efforts into creating all the delicious foods, those amongst us who've been looking after the registrations, administration, caring for people's ailments, all the different ways that everyone here has been offering service, with shelter, with food and medicine, helping to sustain this, this beautiful, rich environment. So rather than just fixating on what I've got out of this retreat or what more I could get out of the retreat, what I like, what I don't like, we can take these last few hours that we have together to let that gratefulness be, be conscious and then to let it bear fruit, to blossom in terms of of offering your own assistance, helping to, to tidy up, to help out, to express appreciation, to lend a hand, so that your practice of realization of not-self, non-attachment, manifests in the most you know, practical and helpful as beautiful ways, as an expression of Sangha. When the Buddha mind sees the way things are, when the Buddha sees the Dhamma, what results is Sangha. When the Buddha sees the Dhamma, what arises is Sangha. When the wisdom mind sees the way things are, what arises is unselfish activity. Sangha, the unified assembly. So if we really want our wisdom, the wisdom and clarity of mind that's been developed in these few days, for that to be fulfilled, then let it manifest as Sangha. The Buddha awakened to the Dhamma, and what arose was the Sangha. Here we are. When the Buddha, wisdom of your own mind, sees the way things are in your life, let that also manifest in the same way as unselfish activity. Love of good company, rejoicing in the presence of like-minded spiritual companions. Now, harmony in the Sangha, the Buddha pointed out, is the most precious, beautiful, important of qualities. Well, let's rejoice in that, celebrate that. So in a moment I'm going to ring the bell, but please don't think, ah, now the practice is finished. <laughs> well, you can think that, but know it just as a thought, and just to see the mode of uh, our practice together is just changing, taking a different shape. So myself and the other monastics will chant some blessings as a way of saying farewell, and then we'll... Uh, get up and depart. We need to be getting in our van and rolling by 9.30. So we need to confine the, all the um, farewells to the minimum. But we'll uh, offer some blessings and share the goodness of this time with each other.
So, um, 